and since I'm paid, you mugging me, you know I'm mugging back. Be mugging me, you know I'm always when I hit the club. Give me that, give me hook, and since I'm paid. To a man with a with a pop trunk. I f over you like I'm sexing on a top rope. I make a lot of noise, boy, like a cop car. The whip got the f out like a pop bra. And you ain't gotta ask your girl, you know she know me from ringtones. She sing my songs at the karaoke. She call me baby all day like I'm Brian Williams, the new hip hop landlord.
Yes, a very good morning to you all. We welcome you to the Tumusime Mtevile Annual Public Lecture. Our theme is Economic Recovery and Resilience in a Post-COVID-19 World, the Role of Higher Education Institutions. I'm glad that we've gathered in a very befitting way here at Makere University CTF2 Auditorium. And I'm also glad that we have a large following online. I'm pleased to let you know that the first activities in line with our program have gone on very well. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Ramadan Gobi, is a Lumumbist. Lumumboye? Ah, it wasn't that loud. Lumumboye? All right, yes. So our keynote speaker started with uh, a visit to his hall of residence, the only hall of residence, which is Lumumba Hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take it that today it's the only hall of residence, Lumumba Hall and Mary Stewart. A box, so yeah? Lumbox, so yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, they had a very special moment there. And in line with our program, he has planted the tree. And I have been informed that um, by God's grace, the tree has started to grow. <laughs> yes. And thereafter, our guest of honor, um, that's Dr. Ramadan Gobi, proceeded to the office of the vice chancellor for a courtesy call, but also to discuss the role of higher education in a very strategic way at that level. And I've been ably informed that the courtesy call has ended, and any time from now, we will be receiving the delegation in this room. And in line with our program, when the delegation arrives, I request ev each and every one of us to rise just to receive them. And then also we will have anthems. The anthems will run in a particular order, the national anthem, East African anthem, and the Makere University anthem. Thereafter, we'll have an opening prayer, and then I'll hand over successfully to the university secretary who will moderate the entire proceedings for today. In a very special way, allow me to say that our key note speaker is a distinguished alumnus of Makere University. And like I told you, during his time here, he was a resident of the great Lumumba Hall. Yes. North Court? No, 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 no. <laughs> but we'll ensure that maybe the second public lecture will ensure that we capture the North Court bit, yes. And then also, we are glad that we'll also be joined by the Deputy Governor Bank of Uganda, still as one of the key dignitaries who will grace the Tumusime Mutevide annual public lecture. We also have the family of Tumosime Mtevile because this is a very special occasion for us. It's more of a memorial lecture, but it also starts the series since we've commenced annual public lectures. And then the rest of us, if protocol fails me, I know the university council, members of Makere University Management, principals, deputy principals, deans, directors, heads of administrative units, but we also have a great representation from the private sector, the business community, our dear students, members of staff, the media fraternity, but for this particular lecture members, at some point I'll be using a word friends of Makere University, 
and friends of Tumusime Mutevide in that capacity to ensure that all the interests are taken care of. Once again, thank you so much. And let me allow the person managing the system to use a few minutes to give us um, some befitting melody as we wait for the delegation to get in. Gentlemen, let us all rise to welcome the delegation. Yes, our keynote speaker, Dr. Ramadan Gobi, you're most welcome. And we thank you very much for honoring our invitation to grace the Tumusime Mutevile annual public lecture. Up here, he's joined by with the university secretary, Mr. Yusuf Chiranda, who is going to be our moderator for the entire occasion. And anthems in this order, the national anthem, the East African anthem, and the Makere University anthem. Yeah. 
Yes, in a very special way, allow me to categorize the protocol as follows. We are honored to have the chairperson of Makere University Council with us. We also welcome the family of Tumusime Mutebile. Thank you so much for joining us. We welcome the Deputy Governor Bank of Uganda and the entire delegation from Bank of Uganda. We have members of Makere University Council. We have the Vice Chancellor of Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs, Professor Umal Kakumba, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration, Professor Henry Ainaitwe, members of Makere University Council, members of Makere University Senate, principals, deputy principals, deans and directors, heads of departments, heads of administrative units. We have friends from the private sector and the business community, friends of Tumusime Mutebile, friends of Makere University, members of staff Makere University, students, ladies, and gentlemen, and we welcome you to the Tumusime Mutebile annual public lecture. We have a befitting audience in CTF2 Auditorium here at Makere University, and we also have a pleasing audience following us online. Allow me to welcome the brother of the late Tumusime Mutebile. The brother is Mr. Joseph Mutebile to lead us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the life of uh, Professor Mutebile, the life she lived and served God and served Uganda. We thank you for Makere University for honoring him. We thank you for the We thank Makere for this honor and we pray that whatever happened this morning and this day praises your name. We pray a blessing to this gathering, a blessing to the university, and we thank you for this honor. We believe that God in all this, and we pray that his soul merits in peace. Thank you. Amen. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Yes. It's now time for me to hand over to Mr. Yusuf Chiranda, the University Secretary, Makere University, to give the opening statement and introduction to this event. Mr. Yusuf Chiranda, over to you. Thank you very much, Rita. Our keynote speaker, the permanent secretary and secretary of the treasury, uh, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, 
Deputy Governor of the Bank of Uganda, the Chairperson and members of Makerere University Council, the Vice Chancellor, members of Makerere University Management, the family of Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevide. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to adopt the protocol which my colleague Rita has already clearly elaborated. Welcome to the second lecture in the Mark at 100 lecture series. I'm the first Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevide Memorial Lecture. I wish to welcome Mrs. Mutevide and the family of Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevide especially. I also thank you, Mr. Ramadan Gobi. We are aware of how tight your schedule is and we do not take it for granted that you have accepted to deliver the first Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutebile Memorial Lecture. As an introduction, we meet to discuss a crucial important subject. The COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent lockdown is to, pre present, pre to present the spread of the virus damaged Uganda's economy as it did for various economies around the globe. The African Development Bank reports that real GDP in 2020 dropped by 0.5% after the economy was growing very impressively in 2019 at 7.5%. A lot of the sectors in the economy were severely affected, those being most affected being tourism and hospitality, wholesale and retail trade, to mention, but only a few. Now, the country's COVID-19 response focused on supporting the health sector to contain the spread of the pandemic and treat those who fell sick, supporting scientists and innovators, provision of additional agriculture inputs, cash for work programs, seed funding to small and micro businesses through MIOGA, social assistance grants for the elderly, popularly known as SEGE, food and cash transfers to vulnerable members of society, credit to savings and credit cooperatives, credit to private sector companies through UDB, establishment of this recovery fund, capitalization of uh, UDC, and most importantly, the decision by government to prioritize the payment of domestic areas to the private sector domestically. But then the government also took a hit in its revenue collection and the COVID-19 containment measures. Consequently, government in the current financial year implemented the 40% cut on the budgets of all MDAs covering nanny wage and development expenditures. Now, with the budget cut by the government, and government being one of the leading players in this economy, the investment or the expenditure by MDAs in the economy also went down, especially where key areas like workshops were frozen, meaning that hotels where government entities are the leading clients do not get business. Now, leading economists, including economic institutions and our very own finance ministry, had projected that the economy would rebound once the COVID-19 situation improved. And this was expected to be followed by the easing of the corresponding containment measures. We expected that as the global economy also picks up, Uganda's exports would grow. And also the rise in domestic consumption would also support the increase of domestic business activity, which would resuscitate the economy that had been sedated by the COVID-19 lockdowns. However, no sooner had the Ugandans celebrated the easing of the COVID-19 situation and the lockdowns than the staggering increase in commodity prices presented yet another daunting challenge to living conditions and business activity, especially among small and medium enterprises. It appears the government has tried to do the best in its means and within its capacity, but probably it is not enough as the challenges continue. 
what can we do better and how? And what can higher education institutions contribute to this discussion and to the pursuit of economic travel in Uganda after COVID-19? That is the question we meet today to explore, and we are lucky that it is going, the lecture is going to be delivered by the man in charge of driving economic thinking and economic policy in this country, the current Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Ramadan Gobi. <laughs> but before we move to him, Makerewe University prides in having the best college of business and management sciences. That is the college where we teach economics. And we cannot talk about economics and economic recovery without hearing from that college. So please of Business and Management Sciences, <laughs> Professor Eria Hisari, meet <laughs> us for the lecture, and then we can keep moving. Professor Hisari. Thank you so much, uh, the University Secretary, the <coughs> Permanent Secretary, Stroke Secretary to the Treasury, the Deputy Governor, Bank of Uganda, the Chairperson and members of the University Council, the Vice Chancellor and members of the University Management Team, the family of the late uh, Professor Emmanuel Tumsime Mutebili, led by uh, Madame Betty and the, my very good friend, uh, General uh, Tumsime Mutebile, <coughs> the Ma Timothy Mutebile, the Makerere University Fraternity, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I very warmly welcome you to the inaugural Tumsime Motabili public lecture at Makerere University. This lecture has been organized to appreciate the contribution of the late Tumsime Motabili to Makerere University, to Uganda, and indeed to humanity. I want to most sincerely thank the leadership of Makerere University for considering this as one of the activities to mark our 100 years of existence. I do hope, I do hope that going forward, we will be able to work very closely with the family and friends of the late Mutebile to make this an annual event. It is also important to recall that the university honored the late Tumusime Mutebide with the Mutebide Endowed Chair in Monetary Policy, Banking and Finance, and also the Center for Private Sector Development. Unfortunately, at the time of his passing on, uh, these activities had not fully been implemented. They had not taken off fully. I have been, in the recent past, engaging with close friends of the late Mutebide, led by uh, the Honorable Matthew Ruchikaire, and we are discussing on modalities of how we can best actualize uh, these initiatives. We will be very soon sharing a roadmap 
on how we can implement these initiatives and we look forward to the support of all of you and even those that are not here. I'm also very glad that we are launching this series with a discussion on a very topical policy issue. An issue that Professor Mutebide himself would have loved to be part of. We look forward to hearing uh, the perspectives of our keynote speaker this morning and to the discussions that will follow. On our side, we are rolling out initiatives through which as a university and as a college of business and management sciences, we will be able to play even a bigger role in discussions on economic recovery and resilience, but also in the economy generally. We have, for example, proposed a graduate entrepreneurship and employment facility. This, if implemented, will go a long way in bridging the gap between uh, training and the world of work. Uh, I'm happy to report at this stage that we have already had engagements with none other than the PSST, and up to this point, uh, it has been received well. We do hope that uh, this will be implemented. We have also, we are also planning to launch the, we are also planning to launch a special purpose vehicle for policy engagement, which we have called the policy labs. Uh, the policy labs will bring together uh, policy makers, policy implementers, key private sector entities, development partners, as well as the academia, once every quarter to discuss topical policy issues. Uh, Mr. PSST, uh, as per the discussion we've had previously, and Mr. Vice Chancellor, we do hope that this will be launched before the end of this financial year. And it will give us a platform to share insights on what we think uh, about the economy in a very organized and more coordinated uh, way. Let me end here by thanking the MAC at 100 Secretariat for successfully organizing this event and uh, to our keynote speaker this morning for, ac uh, for accepting to share his insights on the topic that we have at hand. I wish you a uh, very fruitful deliberations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hisari. It's now my honor uh, to invite Mrs. Betty Mutevire, who is representing the family. Permanent Secretary and Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Ramadan Gobi. The Deputy Governor BOU, Mr. Ting Yego. Makere. University Council, the Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. good morning. So first of all, allow me on behalf of the family to thank Makere University for this commemorative lecture. It is indeed an absolute honor for me to be here today for the inaugural Emmanuel Lecture. Which has been organized by this noble institution to commemorate a hundred years of its service to humanity. It is very comforting to see <coughs> that this institution, Makere, that Emmanuel served and cherished right from his student days as guild president, is aware of his contribution and cares to preserve the memory of his work and personality. The ideas and ideals of the work accomplished by Emmanuel are certainly still with us all and will outlive our generation. The memorial lecture not only commemorates the memory of Professor Emmanuel, but also underlines his vision of creating a transformative and progressive society. Those of us who lived with him and you who worked with him closely, you know that Emmanuel believed that the key to success in any society entails discovery and dissemination of knowledge, which requires close interaction between academia, the private sector, government, and all stakeholders. I'm therefore very happy to see that we are here today to precisely do that. I'm also happy that Macquarie University has honored Emmanuel, rather honored Emmanuel, where he was still with us in recognition of his outstanding professional contributions to the socioeconomic transformation and advancement of Uganda with the, with the two initiatives which have been mentioned earlier. The Emmanuel Tumusimia Mtevide Center of Excellence for Private Sector Development, and two, the Emmanuel Tumusimia Mtevide Chair in Monetary Policy, Banking and Finance. I really want to assure you that when these honors were bestowed upon him, he generously accepted the honor, the challenges therein, and dedicated himself to serve Makere and Uganda in those capacities. <laughs> Aware of the problems that continue to be the devour our society. It's my sincere hope that Emmanuel Tumusimia Mtewile Chair in Monetary Policy, Banking and Finance, and the Center of Excellence for Private Sector Development Initiatives will continue to inspire transformative solutions and employment generations in Uganda. This way we shall surely ensure that the aspirations that Professor Emmanuel stood for are kept alive for generations to come distinguished participants. You are also aware that following the launch of the above initiatives, the Tumusimia Mutebile Foundation was established in July 2016. The objectives of the foundation is not only to support the above twin initiatives, but also to establish a forum for local and international partnerships in order to promote the sustainable socio-economic transformation in Uganda, of Uganda. The foundation offices were initially located in Lower Kololo, but we have now relocated to Nakawa Business Center. We welcome everyone to the foundation as we continue to pursue Manuel's agenda for the transformation of Uganda. 
And we as a family, we do pledge our support to these initiatives. In every sphere of life, of course, we follow some basic principles and tenets. Emmanuel loved and valued his work and would come home from meetings very energized and even more enthusiastic than he usually was. He really loved his work. It's for us as a family, it's like we, he, he, he was a man of the nation. He belonged more to the nation than maybe to the family. But as we celebrate Emmanuel's professional achievements, we should not forget his personal charm, warmth, and charisma, all delivered with a smile. Spending time with Emmanuel. It was always enjoyable. Um, let us have just a brief melody. It's okay. It's okay. I'll finish. Spending time with Emmanuel was always enjoyable. And I believe that his liquor will live on in our hearts and minds. We as a family are forever grateful to God for his life. He was a gift to us all. We are all better people because of his hard work and his noble causes which he championed and cherished. He was God-fearing. He loved reading scriptures and worshiping. He was actually the priest in our home. He was a disciplinarian as well, but in love, he did it in love. Emmanuel was very formal in all he did. We had to dress formally for dinner and observe all etiquette. He was very formal in all his ways. We have a friend, very close friend of our family. One day, okay, she became a minister at one time, and as soon as she became minister, when she came to pay a cancer call home, or maybe to inquire from Emmanuel some of the things she was expected to do, the moment she arrived home and he was told that she was in the house, he immediately had to put on a coat, a tie, in order to go and meet her because she had become minister. <laughs> and for me, I was just calling her by her first name. Emmanuel would look at me very surprised. <laughs> but that was Emmanuel for you, very formal. Emmanuel belonged to several clubs and groups. He loved hosting his friends. There is this Rotary Club that he belonged to for very many years. He always had 100% attendance. Those of you who are Rotarians know that what, what that means. Even when we traveled, or he traveled, he always had to make up wherever he would have traveled to make sure that he attends so that he attains his 100% attendance. Sunday was an open day at home for everyone, family and friends. People would come even without appointments. We would have not only lunch, but also we would have times of praise and worship and read the scriptures and pray. That was Emmanuel. Emmanuel never described, discriminated anyone. He received and respected all people regardless of race, beliefs and tribe, and even political affiliation. He never even <laughs> reminded me that we are from different tribes. He never ever did that. Attending team for me was such a joy. 
because he was very appreciative. He appreciated everyone and anyone. He did not talk much. <laughs> I did all the talking. But he was a very good listener. In all my life with him, and I've said this before, I do not ever recall hearing Emmanuel say a negative word about anyone, even when they would have provoked him. Never, ever. He was very special. At first I thought maybe he learned these values from Rotary, but his elder sister who is here with us told me no, their dad was like that. I really thank God for, his, for the gifts that Manuel had. He kept any of those unlikely, rather likely misgivings himself. We know that Emmanuel is in a better place and we believe that we'll see him when Christ comes. As Christians, we believe that when Christ appears, them that died in Christ will appear with him. And so uh, we'll definitely see Emmanuel again. As for me, I know that he lives and we are spirits and I know that he's alive. I want to thank you for listening to me and it's all about this emotional <laughs> breakdown. Thank you. Yes, the audience has done it so well, a befitting hand clap, but let it be a bit louder. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, and uh, just say so that in the same spirit, Emmanuel loved Christ the King Church. And he also generously contributed to the development of so many churches in this country. Allow me to, in line with our program, humbly request the Deputy Governor, Bank of Uganda, to speak to us. Let us welcome the Deputy Governor, Bank of Uganda. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, our keynote speaker this morning, the Permanent Secretary, Secretary Treasury. Um, Mrs. Tumusme Mutebili and the, and the family members here present, uh, the late governor, the vice chancellor, members of the management and the fraternity of Macro University, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, allow me to thank Macro University for organizing this public lecture to honor an accomplished gentleman by the names of Professor Emmanuel Tomusime Mutebile. It's not that every day you have such a gentleman with such accomplished achievements. The contributions made by the late governor to the economic management in Uganda are simply unmatched. I'll just focus on one of them. For those of you who are old enough, you know what inflation in this country meant. Inflation was raging in triple digit. I, I say triple digits. One time it had reached close to 200%. When Emmanuel was appointed a permanent secretary, secretary treasury, his first task was to lower inflation. And he did so decisively, courageously, and he faced the power that be by speaking truth to what needed to be done to low inflation. And that was fiscal discipline, cash management. If there was no cash, there was no expenditure. So in that way, 
he was able to lower inflation in a very short period of time. Now, when he became the governor of Bank of Uganda, he only came in to consolidate the achievements that he had established in the Ministry of Finance by putting in place a strong monetary policy framework that has served the country to date and ensuring that the country continues to enjoy single-digit inflation, even as we talk right now. Countries like the U.S. are having inflation of 8.5% per annum. Uganda's latest inflation numbers are just at 3.7%. It shows you the kind of gentleman <laughs> money was. So how did all this start? It's not that he just woke up one morning and developed his courage or what have you. It began in his youth days. This morning I was with the vice chancellor and we were discussing the late governor's role when I was a student of Macquarie University. And we were particularly looking at how he stood to very challenging circumstances. When the then President Idi Amin decided to expel the Asians in Uganda, Emmanuel Tomusimi Mutebile went to City Square, I mean, went to the, uh, to the Freedom Square and denounced the actions of Idi Amin in expelling Asians because he knew the economic consequences of doing that. And indeed, he was correct. You all saw what happened when the Asians were expelled. So he had the courage to do that. So rising up to the challenges of the day meant that he was nurturing himself for positions for leadership. So students of high institutions of learning, including Macro University, you need to ask yourself, what are you doing as a student that is going to shape the destiny of our country. You have a role in rising up to the challenges in a bold and a courageous manner. Now, Emmanuel Tumusimi Mutsebile is a man who believed, or was a man who believed in building capacity of his subordinates. He began it in the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development by building the capacity of junior officers in there. And he did so in different ways. There was a program that was called the ODI, which, which brought in uh, some young graduates from the universities in the, in the UK to work in the Ministry of Finance and Bank of Uganda. That, that alone was, was an angle where the, the capacity of the officers in both the Ministry of Finance and Bank of Uganda was built by interacting with these guys. They were able to build capacity without going for training. And then, of course, also, he encouraged the training of officers at higher, level, um, at higher levels of education, going for master's degrees and going for PhDs. When he came into Bank of Uganda, he continued doing exactly the same thing, and the capacity there was created. We've heard of his contributions towards higher institutions of learning, including Macquarie University, that we are here today to, to recall. So in other words, he is someone who believed in succession planning. He knew that we cannot be there forever, so you need to leave a team behind that's going to really carry your legacy. And I won't believe that, it, that such a team has been created by the late governor. And that's why his legacy of macroeconomic management, prudent macroeconomic management, continues to, to date. So the challenge that we have here, as we remember the governor, is how do we continue to maintain this legacy. And that's why I'm very glad that we are going to have these annual public lectures, just to keep reminding ourselves that how are we honoring the legacy of the late governor? We need to do so by reminding ourselves of his achievements and where we are not doing it right, where have we missed it, and we need to go back and reboot if necessary. So that is the only way, as far as I'm concerned, that we can remember the legacy of, of uh, the, the late governor. So really without wasting much time. I just want once again to thank Macro University for organizing this annual public lecture. And hopefully, we will get together, bring the different stakeholders who have got interest in this, and have some form of secretariat where we can have one major lecture that brings together uh, different players so that we can have a lecture that really talks to, uh, to the legacy of the, the governor. So as I conclude, I want to encourage the family of the late governor, Betty, you don't have to apologize for being emotional. 
You remember, even Jesus Christ, when he went to the grave of Lazarus, the shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept. So this is the guy who created the world. He also wept. So it's normal to weep, particularly when you are coming to terms with the loss of a loved one. And I won't believe that the Almighty God is going to give you the strength and the courage to live through this. And um, may his soul rest in eternal peace. I thank you for your kind attention, and God bless. Yes, we are celebrating a life well lived, the Tumusime Mtevile annual public lecture, and it is annual, so we will be expecting you every year, but also Makere University as an institution, we are celebrating 100 years of existence, and permit me to request our Leader, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, the Vice Chancellor, to come and speak to us. And I'm also in the same spirit requesting the two Deputy Vice Chancellors to accompany him. It is rare that we have all the three in a room, so let us take this as Makere at 100 celebration as a unique gesture. The Vice Chancellor will be in the middle and I'll ensure that the deputies ably protect him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're most welcome, Vice Chancellor, and also our Deputy Vice Chancellors. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can see I'm properly protected. <laughs> <laughs> the Permanent Secretary and Secretary to the Treasury, Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, and our keynote speaker, this morning, Mr. Ramadan Gowi, the Chairperson of Council, Mrs. Lona Magara, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Uganda, Mr. Michael Ating Ego, members of council, the deputy vice chancellors and members of management and staff, Mrs. Betty Motevile and the family of the late Professor Emmanuel Musime Motevile, the guild leadership, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you all to the first ever Professor Musime Motevile annual public lecture and the second discourse in the Makerere at 100 lecture series. In a special way, I welcome our keynote speaker and permanent secretary, secretary to the treasury, Mr. Ramadan Govi, back to his alma mater, Makerere University. As a gallant alumnus, your achievements, both in the lecture room and the research realm, are a great source of pride especially as we celebrate 100 years of impactful existence and service to society. I equally extend a warm and special welcome to the family of the late Professor Tumsime Mutevile. Thank you for honoring our invitation on this day when we recognize the legacy of a former guild president, great scholar, seasoned economist, and honorary professor who served as Governor Bank of Uganda for 21 years and also as the chairman of the Makere University Private Sector Forum. Makere occupied a special place in Professor Tumusime Mtevile's heart. He always honored our invitations to events and at the time of his departure had expressed willingness to participate in stakeholder mobilization as we hold year-long celebrations to mark 100 years of existence. We shall dearly miss his contribution to our centenary celebrations. On the occasion of the inauguration of the Tumsime Mtevile Chair in Monetary Policy and Finance, 
and laying of the foundation stone of the Tumusimi Mutivili Center of Excellence in private sector development on 27th October 2015. Professor Tumusimi Mutivili said, and I quote, Uganda has made impressive strides in both the economic and political areas during the last 30 years. We have overcome those painful days of our history and moved on. I am proud to have been associated with the policies that have brought about the restoration of the economy. End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the man whose contribution we are gathered here today to celebrate. As his alma mater, Makere University is extremely proud to host this first of the annual lectures in commemoration of Professor Tumsimi Mtivile's legacy. Makere University is also proud to have made her contribution in shaping the legacy of this great son of Africa. I take this opportunity to thank the government of Uganda and particularly the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development for supporting research and innovation at Makere University through the Research and Innovation Fund. We therefore thank you, Ms. Agovi, for accepting to deliver the first Tumsimam Tevile annual public lecture. We equally look forward to hearing your thoughts on how we, as institutions, can better position ourselves to solve society challenges and lead economic recovery and resilience efforts at national level. But I'm sure that you are aware, our keynote speaker, that Makere University has the potential to help you to transform the economy of this country. <laughs> if you need one partner of whom you are sure that if you send money there, it will be used for what you sent it, <laughs> and that there will be results, it is Makerere University. <laughs> we demonstrated that during the COVID time, the whole response on COVID was actually based on what we at Makerere advised the government to do. <laughs> there are a lot of innovations coming out of this country. If you invest here wisely, the, <laughs> the economy of this country will change drastically in a very short time. <laughs> I once again welcome all of you warmly to Makere University and wish you good listening as we build for the future. Thank you. Yes, I requested the Vice Chancellor to ensure that he is with the Deputy Vice Chancellors, for a reason, we are celebrating Makere at 100, and um, the chairperson of Makere University at 100 celebrations is Right Honorable Daniel Chidega, that's the chairperson, and he's our Deputy Chairperson of Council. The alternate chair for Mark at 100 celebrations is Professor Barnabas Naangwe, the Vice Chancellor. Then we have Professor Umal Kakumba, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs at Makere University, and he's the chairperson of the program committee, Mark at 100 celebrations. And we have Professor Henry Alinaitwe, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Finance and Administration, and he's the chairperson of the Finance and Resource Mobilization Committee, Mark at 100 celebrations. I'm also aware that in the audience, we have several members of the organizing committee mark at 100 celebrations. I have seen Mr. Don Wanyama. Don? Yes. May I also request all the members of mark at 100 organizing committee to kindly stand up for recognition. Members of Makere University at 100 organizing committee, Kindly wave to the audience. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Yusuf Chiranda, over to you. Thank 
you very much, Rita. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now reach the moment when what we have been waiting for is about to come. But before that, a short introduction of our speaker as per the program. Mr. Ramadan Gobi is an accomplished economist and policy analyst who is currently serving as the permanent secretary, Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, and Secretary of the Treasury of the Republic of Uganda. Let me add that in that position is the appointing authority of all accounting officers of all government votes, including Makerele University. Uh, Mr. Gobi spent most of his years teaching economics at several universities, but most of the time he spent it teaching at Makerele University Business School since January 2008 until he was appointed PSST in July 2021. While at MOOBS, he headed the think tank, the MOOBS Economic Forum, that made groundbreaking research and caused public debates, which generated viable policy-related solutions. September 2017 and September 2020, Ramadan served on the board of directors of the Uganda Development Corporation, the investment arm of the Uganda government. At the end of his term as board member of UDC, he was rated the best director, both by fellow directors and the management of UDC. Between 2020 and 2021, Mr. Gobi served as a senior presidential advisor on national economy and accomplished several tasks assigned to him by H.E. the President. He has consulted widely with several organizations, including the International Labour Organization, the Overseas Development Institute of the UK, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the Financial Sector Deepening Program of Uganda, Action Coalition for Development and Environment, and many other agencies. As Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Gobi has set his agenda to reform the national budget and make it more responsive to national development priorities and appraise its implementation. And uh, those of us involved in the national budget processes at the level of our entities, we know that the budgeting process for the current, for the next financial year has been quite more demanding compared to those of the previous financial years. And all that we are told by the colleagues in finance that our question is coming from the Secretary of Treasury. Uh, Mr. Govi is a double alumnus of Makerele University. Uh, currently, he ha is, is pursuing a PhD at Walden University in the USA since 2019, but he holds a master's in economics, in economic policy and planning from Makerele University, which he was awarded in 2011, and a BA in economics, economics major, with which he graduated with honors from Makerele University in 2003. He has a certificate in energy economics from Total Global and a certificate in sustainable development, which he attained with distinction from Columbia University, USA. I wish to add that he is a Lumumbist. <laughs> but with dual citizenship. He told us that he was also sometimes from Nkrumah. <laughs> now, Mr. Gobi, uh, as you speak about reviving the economy and the role of higher education institutions, is the whole of Makerele University is here, from the council to the teachers to the students. Some of them I know where you are on teachers. They are still doing a good job here. And as the vice chancellor said, to invest well is to invest in Makerele. Please. Mr. Govi, your audience. Uh, thank you very much. 
the university secretary for that generous introduction. I'm sorry, uh, my voice is not very good. I have some, some flu, but I don't have COVID. <laughs> they test me uh, every week twice. I tested yesterday, I'm, I'm fine. The chairperson, no, 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 I will start with the Mrs. Mutevile and the entire family of Professor Emmanuel Musime Mutevile. I'm very honored to have you here uh, this morning. Um, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, my good friend, Dr. Tinge Go, Michael, the Chairperson of Makere University Council, and your Council, um, the Vice Chancellor of Makere, and your team, Um, all of the principals of the colleges of Makere University and all of the professors of Makere, many of whom taught me, and I'm glad to see you. I can see all of them here, Professor Bale Edward, that one taught me from secondary school. Um, Dr. Mtenyo, Dr. Tom, of course, not forgetting uh, Professor Isali, all of those were my teachers from year one, and many others, I'm sure, they all over the place. The entire university fraternity, the students, all of the alumni of this great institution, and I'm sure friends of Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevile. All of the protocols are observed, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. What an immense pleasure to return to this intellectual powerhouse to honor one of the greatest economists and reformers of our time, and also to talk about a little bit the economic recovery efforts that the government of Uganda and its partners are trying to spearhead. On behalf of the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, and specifically the hundreds of fellow alumni of this great institution working in the ministry, I'm delighted to congratulate Makere upon reaching 100 years of building for the future. Um, Makere, as we all know, is one of the world's most prestigious universities. Its alumni include world leaders, top-notch intellectuals, leading business executives, and many other impactful human beings, both living and dead. I thank you very heartily, the Vice Chancellor and your team, for inviting me and enabling me to return to Makere for the first time as a secretary to the Treasury of the Republic of Uganda. I started my journey of training as an economist, as they have told you here. There are a number of things I am scheduled to do, even today, but I honestly can't think of one that would 
make me happy and proud than one of promoting economics and those who have promoted it before. Until recently, my life was work, my teaching, my research, my public writing, my community work, and my Twitter and Facebook posts have all been about trying to demonstrate to fellow Ugandans what I learned while I was in the gates of Makerere. And that is that economics is not common sense per se. This public lecture is about three areas I'm going to talk about. The first one is the main challenges we are currently addressing to recover the economy from the pandemic which has uh, battered it, as well as other shocks which can have come in, uh, in the recent months. Number two, the roles that institutions of higher learning, like Makerere, may play to catalyze this recovery. But most importantly, talking about the gigantic legacy of the late Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevire, arguably the grandfather of the economy we have today of Uganda. I will not belabor to explain the extent to which COVID-19 has impacted us. In any case, the entire world has been a laboratory and us all the specimen for its torment. From the anguish of losing our loved ones, I checked last night that the total world loss to COVID has hit 6.23 million people. Six million people have died, plus 230,000. These are human beings dead in two years. It's not money, you know. When we say six million, some people say six million, okay. I don't know whether you have ever seen a million people in one place. But we are talking of six million people dead. And of these, 3,597 were Ugandans. And COVID has also disrupted our recovery, has made the inflation higher, as I'm going to elaborate. And the pandemic also has plagued the human race in so many ways that we all know. At its peak, the global economic growth declined to minus 3.1% in 2020. From 2.9% growth in 2019, to grow in minus terms means instead of the economy expanding, it was shrinking. In Uganda's case, economic activity was cut by more than half. The services sector was the most affected, in particular education, transport, hospitality, and entertainment activities. These were totally closed down. The size of the labor force has declined with many workers moving from the modern and the same modern sectors into subsistence agriculture. For the first time in a long time in Uganda, we have had urban rural migration. People used to come from rural to urban. In the past two years, people have been leaving the cities to the villages. The share of the working person is in the subsistence agriculture has increased from 41% to 52% before and after the outbreak of the pandemic. As we talk now, 6.8 million Ugandans housed in 3.5 million households are in the subsistence economy. Already the university secretary has told you 
that uh, revenue shortfalls hit us. We expected this financial year to collect 22 trillion shillings. We are likely to collect about 20 trillion plus some few uh, billions. So already half a year or about eight months, we registered a shortfall of one trillion and 26 billion shillings. Yet, COVID-19 brought increased expenditure needs. We had to spend money to keep Ugandans alive. In the Ministry of Health, we have had to spend an extra 1.2 trillion so that we can keep Ugandans alive. And uh, I should say, we have succeeded to a great extent to keep the people alive. And also in security. Some of you have heard that we have spent a lot of money in security, not for any other reason, but to enforce the SOPs so that Ugandans can keep away from the danger of this virus. I will now turn to briefly a topic which Ugandans have been debating a lot, commodity prices. Economists know that it takes time for external shocks to manifest themselves. In this case, they have started with the prices for essential items, particularly land bus soap, fuel, cooking oil, building materials like cement and steel, some food items, as well as education services. These have significantly increased in recent months, their prices. As a result, inflation has risen to 3.7% in March 2022, as the Deputy Governor already told you. I will later elaborate why the current events with Ugandans feeling that the inflation of 3.7% is unbearable, is perhaps one of the key ingredients in the late Mutevire's monumental legacy. Because by the time he took the office that I occupy now, inflation in Uganda was galloping in a triple digits. In 1986, December, the inflation of Uganda was registered at 358%. I know that it sounds very ridiculous. We know 100% is the highest, but the inflation of Uganda was at 358% in December meaning that prices were more than doubling every, every single year. Recently, in 2011, inflation peaked at around 35%. But in the months when it started around June of 2011, accelerating at around 11, 12, 15 percent, the Ugandans started what they call walk to work. You remember? People were walking to work, led by, of course, politicians and other mobilizers. They mobilized the Ugandans. Let us protest against this high inflation. I, I was a, a teacher at MOOBS. I used to tell my students that had Ugandans lived in, in, 20, in the 1970s, because by the time Idi Amin left in 1979, inflation was above 200, about 214 percent, and also lived in the 1980s, as I've told you, 358 percent in December of 1986. If some of those who were walking, walking were there, 
they wouldn't have walked to work. They would have run to work. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Ugandans feel the pinch of 3.7% inflation today, it shows you the kind of work people like the great man Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevila have done for this country. The causes of the current price increase are largely external and supply side related, key of which is the effect of COVID-19 restrictions, which disrupted supply chains worldwide, leading to higher transport costs, leading to shortage of shipping containers, leading to shortage of raw materials, and higher fuel prices. The inflation is logistical in nature. This cocktail has curtailed smooth manufacturing and production as well as movement of goods and services leading to increased commodity prices. In addition, the full opening of economies globally after COVID had risened has led to a swift rise in aggregate demand for a number of goods and services, such as fuel. We all, when they opened us up, we went to the feeding stations to fill our tanks. And yet, I've told you on the supply side, these companies are constrained in the amounts of fuel they can move around the world because of the same challenges of COVID. And with the demand rising, with the constrained supply, prices usually rise. Also, we've had the swift demand in the transport. As people reopened, we demanded more transport services. The taxis and the buses, which used to carry half, now they had to go back to full board. That is increased demand for transport services. Education services have also been demanded in higher levels. Right now we are grappling at the government with the challenge of absorbing so many children of Uganda who have come back to school when some schools have closed business because of COVID. Some of the private schools could not reopen. So those children have gone to the few schools which stayed open. And the, this has led to increased demand of education services. And some of these schools, since they are operating in a liberal environment, which also I will emphasize a bit later, they increase the fees. So as a result of those factors I'm talking about, we have seen prices increasing. And since crisis or shocks, are like a taxis. Another one is often on the way as one leaves the stage. The Russia-Ukraine conflict emerged as COVID left the stage and has further disrupted the supply of goods such as oil, wheat, maize, and sunflower, as well as raw materials, which are so critical for manufacturing. The two countries are major producers and exporters of these goods. And this has further increased the challenges that we already had. What is government doing? Please note that the causes of the current spike in the prices are number one, supply related. Number two, external. Number three, global. They are affecting the entire world. Government policy response, therefore, must focus on addressing the supply constraints, most of which are external, as I have said, and affecting the entire world. Anything else implemented would be a wrong medicine 
to a known ailment. Therefore, as government, we are concentrating on the following. Number one, ensuring that we maintain a competitive environment so that we can support a continuous supply of the goods and services whose stream is currently constrained, i.e. fuel, soap, cooking oil, cement, steel, and others I've mentioned. And in this, we want to avoid creating more shortages. We cannot afford to make a demand outstrip supply. So in whatever you are thinking government could do, please make sure that your proposal does not make a demand exceed the supply. Most of the things some people want us to do are good common sense, but very bad economics. Supporting farmers to grow more food is also on our cards. We want to support farmers to grow more food to ensure that we do not suffer food shortages. Why? Because food is the main driver of Uganda's inflation. If the prices, as we have seen them for soap, for cooking oil, we are rising in areas of staple food for Ugandans, the situation would have been very different today. We are a bit having some breathing space because Uganda now has food, and not by mistake, by government policy. We are also facilitating more exports to take advantage of the shocks. Those ones I've mentioned. So we want to take advantage of these external shocks instead of them taking advantage of us. So we shall support further people who are going to export those various commodities that we export so that they can earn more foreign exchange for us to pay for the now the few expensive imports. I also wanted, as I was writing this, to ask myself, what would Mutevide have done if he was the one in charge? As he was some years ago. And this brings me now to the gigantic legacy of the late Emmanuel to Musime Mutevide, whom I have several, and I repeat, referred to as the grandfather chose to keep the, that economics doesn't work. And Mutevira uh, taught us that lesson. Beginning in 1966, the state of Uganda had assumed the lead in all the major economic activities. The leaders then, and the people of Uganda, thought this was the best way of ensuring that the economy works for everyone. That when you get the state to tell suppliers of fuel that this is the price you should sell at, don't exceed 4,000 shillings a litre, that that's the best way you have the interests of the people of Uganda. I'm going to tell you what happened. In 1969, in a bid to enable indigenous Ugandans to have a say in economic affairs of their country, which at, which at the time was dominated by Asians and British immigrants, and for the realization of the real meaning of independence, President Obote announced a move to the left culminating into the infamous 1970 Common Man's Charter. I'm speaking a lot of history for the kind of audience I have because I'm deliberate. I would want you to know where Uganda has come from. That's when you will know where Uganda is now and where Uganda is going and how we should get there. 
This was the beginning of the control model in Uganda, 1969. When Idi Amin took power in 1971, economics was replaced by flawed common sense. As we heard in the numerous eulogies of by his contemporaries of Professor Emmanuel Mutebile, Mutebile took the risk to remind the brush and uh, uh, those who were unappraised, like Idi Amin, how economics works. And for this, he paid a very huge price for reminding them how economics should work. Yet many Ugandans then considered him a nationalist. Even today, many Ugandans silently support Amin's expulsion and expropriation of Asian property. Amin's price and foreign exchange controls and many other economic distortions. Generations of my students, none of whom was born by 1972, when Amin executed the economic war, and by the way, neither I was born then. I was born in May of 1978, when Amin was about to leave. As well as various groups of people, I have taught Uganda's economic history during my, often, those my sojourns around the country, they have often expressed support and silent admiration of Amini's nationalist credentials. A younger Mutebile was conscious enough to comprehend Amini's economic distortions and human rights violations and risked to oppose them. Yet like many budding economists of the time, Mutebile started as a socialist. He quickly muted, uh, mutated into a liberal thinker and went on to help Uganda to get rid of these economic distortions. The economic distortions Mutebile helped Uganda to get rid of include the following. Number one, Mutebile helped this country to get rid of price controls. These controls had resulted into emergence of black markets, popularly known as Magendo, involving hoarding of basic groceries and other essential commodities. Today, if we carried out a referendum on television, on radio, and we asked Ugandans what should Ramadan do on the prices of uh, cooking oil, soap, and one of the politicians in the parliament, as I have been interacting with them, proposes that let us fix the price of cooking oil a litre at 2,000 and a bar of soap at 2,000 and so on. Many Ugandans would say Ramadan, you are the man. Now you are working. That is terrible economics. It would create demand rise and outstrip supply. Because even if you go and try to supply the soap to, to, to produce it as a government, the people would buy more. Because now they can afford to buy more. You know, those days, because now Amini controlled the price and other subsequent governments, people would listen to the budget religiously. As they were reading the budget, everybody had a radio in the ears waiting for the list of prices. The ministers of finance, after reading the budget, would read the list of prices. The following are the prices. So this, this, this. Honorable Minister, are you the one who produces the things you are reading? <laughs> is it your money that is being used to produce those items? If you are not the one producing them, why are you determining the price? 
So what the sellers used to do was to remove the goods from the shops and keep them somewhere. They hide them. Whoever wants to buy soap, you go to the outlet and everywhere they tell you we don't have soap. But as you are going back, you know, very disappointed, some young person comes after you. What are you looking for, sir? I want soap. There's no soap in this town. Come, we have some at home. They take you and they sell you a bar at some price which should have been the market price. Who's that younger person taking you? Is the daughter of the other soap attendant who told you there is no soap in the, in the country. That's what we call Magendo. We no longer have that in Uganda and we shall not have it again. <laughs> Secondly, Mutebira kicked smuggling out of Uganda. The few smugglers you see today have a DNA of smuggling. They are grandchildren <laughs> of those people who were smuggling in the 70s. What, you, what brought smuggling to Uganda? Due to economic mismanagement, the past governments were unable to collect enough tax revenue to finance government expenditures. To deal with this challenge, the governments resorted to levying exorbitant import tariffs to raise revenue. The high tariffs forced traders to engage in smuggling never to pass via the official inlets. Malaba, Busia, Mutukula, no. People go to Panya to bring in goods. Why? Because Amin had put a hundred percent tax on cigarettes, on alcohol. People want to drink alcohol, a hundred percent tax. So they could come and use Panya to bring in the goods. When Mutevira took charge of the economy, he said the tax policy must be prudent. Tax Ugandans at rates which they can afford to pay. And that's what we are doing up to now. I'm telling you and I repeat, those who are still smuggling have to be checked, have a DNA of smuggling. The third thing Mutevira did is that he helped Uganda to stop printing money to finance budget deficits. Bank of Uganda had been turned into a printing press of money. Consequently, inflation had galloped into triple digits. From Idi Amin through to the government, that cocktail of governments which ruled Uganda for about one and a half years, 1980, to about a two, to the first, to the first few years of the current government, Uganda was printing money. And Mutevira told them, this economics does not work. You don't just go to the printing press and churn out cash. You have to earn the money as a government. And we said, Bye-bye to printing money. That's what we call monetary discipline. Mutavira also saved Uganda from black markets. This used to emerge as a result of fixed exchange rates. For example, the official exchange rate in 1986 was fixed at Uganda shillings 14. 14 shillings and 50 shillings per US dollar for essential and non-essential imports, respectively. They, were, they used to have a dual exchange rate system. Two windows. You are going to import essential goods like a fuel, go to window one. Access the dollar cheaply. You are going to bring uh, some luxuries, like a cosmetics, perfumes, go to window two. Now, those who are going to bring fuel, they used to buy a dollar at 14 shillings. Those who are going to bring alcohol, 50 shillings a dollar. Now, this is what younger people see on paper, and they say, how I wish we could live in the Uganda 
like this one, where exchange rate was low. That exchange rate was artificial. It used to cause problems. Fixing the exchange rate led to shortage of foreign exchange and emergence of black markets, which used to be called the Chivanda market for foreign currencies. As a result of that, international trade was severely affected, leading to a shortage of imported goods and services. Uganda had rampant shortages of imports. These things we take for granted today, where goods are poured all over the roads, the roadsides, and you know, you are shopping, flat irons, electric kettles, refrigerators on the roadside, it's not by mistake or by good omen. It's because of good economics. Ask your parents. My mom told me she bought a kettle, electric kettle, to buy it. She had to get a friend who was traveling to Dubai. You give them money to buy your kettle. Because there was no foreign exchange to bring those goods. They used to first write a cheat. You write a cheat to the deputy governor to sell you some dollars to go. Today, these goods are being moved around. You know, hawkers now, they, they dress up in all sorts of goods. One of these days, you wake up and somebody has a refrigerator on your doorsteps. Do you want a refrigerator? Why? Because those goods now can come in freely. There is a foreign exchange in Uganda. And those things we take for granted, they were because of the work which was done by these great people, like Emmanuel Tumusime Mutebira and some other people he worked with. In addition, Mutebira helped Uganda to restore fiscal discipline. He re-established the discipline of government maintaining a fiscal position that is consistent with macroeconomic stability and sustained economic growth. Government avoided excessive borrowing and debt accumulation, committed more spending of the national budget on productive activities in the economy. What today you are, I, he, I hear, Ugandans, and I feel it, and we are reforming ourselves fully. When Ugandans say, look at the debt levels, the debt numbers, I would, want to, I would want to tell you, as a person who sits in the treasury every day, Uganda is a very lucky country. To have had people like Emmanuel Tumusime Mutebiri, to put in place a framework in which some of us can come and fit in and be able to reform a few things and the systems work perfectly. Uganda's debt levels we will never get out of the sustainable levels because they are very well anchored on that discipline. It was also Mutebire who masterminded the merger of the Ministry of Finance with the Ministry of Planning and Economic Development in March 1992. My ministry I had today as the head of the technical team was not there before 92. There were two ministries. There was a Minister of Finance and there was also a Ministry of Planning and Economic Development. Now, somebody may ask, merging them, is that also a big deal? Oh, yeah. These two ministries had caused a very big challenge for Uganda. Fiscal indiscipline because of uncoordinated policy movements. Finance was responsible for collecting revenue and financing the budget. Economic planning and development was responsible for coming up with the plan and the budget. So the one who was planning and budgeting was not the one with the money. Already you can see the challenge which was there. Mutevira was at planning and economic development with Josh Mayanji and Kanji as his minister. And there were other 
group I will not mention at finance. And these guys could make a plan and the other guys are financing other things. They are saying let us invest in agriculture, in roads, in energy, in this. The guys are buying cars. They are facilitating the travel abroad. They are giving money to different sorts of people. That's what we call fiscal indiscipline. When the money does not speak to the plan, we are now fully realigning and ensuring that the budget is informed by the, by the plan. And once it is informed by the plan, it must adhere to a cash budget display. If there is cash, let us spend it. If there is no cash, please wait. You, you will not die. Uganda will not end. And that's what we, we are going to be doing going forward in the memory of the late Mutevile. So this improved the coordination of macroeconomic management helped Uganda to fight inflation. Inflation reduced from 54.5% in 1990 to 93 after the merger of the ministry to 5.1 the following financial year, 1993-94. Within one year, inflation had moved from double digits to the target. As a pioneer PSST, Mutebida implemented three basic principles. Number one, prudence. Ensuring that expenditure by government was in line with revenue and limiting borrowing strictly to necessary needs. When I went to finance in the budget, which I, I had also participated as an outsider for some time analyzing, I knew where sometimes the problem comes from. And I've told my people in finance, and they, they have appreciated this, that it is wrong for us to call certain things expenditure pressures, that we have expenditure pressures. What does that terminology mean? Expenditure pressures. That because you are pressurized, you have to find money to spend on it. I said from today, we should have only expenditure needs. If something is not a need, and you are convinced in your analysis, please tell me as Secretary of the Treasury, this one we could avoid it. And we should avoid it. And that is Mutevide who taught us that. Number two, sustainability. No expenditure commitments that couldn't be sustained over the medium and longer term. That budget tokenism, huh? because um, there are some people who want some money, you throw some money to them. We call, it, we call them supplementary expenditures. You have heard about these debates. Slowly, it is a, it's going to be a marathon to get these things out of our faces. But I want to assure you, we shall get there. <laughs> Number three is consistency. All expenditures in line with the government's longer goal of building an independent, integrated, and self-sustaining economy. Those three principles guided uh, Mr. Mutevira's PSST, and uh, it is very good practice for us all. In addition, Mutevira jealously defended the independence and authority of Bank of Uganda when now he switched to the central bank. He defended this authority, its authority over monetary policy as anchored in the Bank of Uganda Act, regulation and supervision of banks as anchored in the Financial Institutions Act, and the performance of its function is without subjecting it to the direction or control of any person or authority, as the Constitution dictates. This transformed the bank into a credible institution with the prime objective of maintaining price stability. Mutevira led the crusade 
of private sector development to reduce government and its inefficiencies in doing business. I know uh, when we are in these seats where we are, there are some controversial decisions we must take. They take time for people to understand them, especially when they start to see the fruits of those decisions. Mutevile was not very far away from these controversies. As you know, he initiated with the, his team the idea of privatizing state-owned enterprises, which had uh, turned the treasury into their petty cash. They mismanage themselves, they go to the treasury to get money. Mutevile sold all of them. One time I remember we were in the main building there debating uh, with Ali Mazului, Professor Ali Mazului. When they came out, I got the opportunity to see Mutevile briefly. I told him that, Governor, you really sold these companies. If you had gotten a buyer, you were about to sell government itself. <laughs> and he had a very good laugh. And I, I, I want to tell you that many people don't appreciate, don't understand what this kind of hard decision he took with his colleagues meant for Uganda. Uganda today is stable. Uganda today is transforming very fast, partly and majorly because of that decision. You know, prior to privatization, the government used to do everything. Government was the one running hotels. Imagine the government laying beds in a hotel. Government was the one producing cooking oil, soda, and so on. But as you know, government is a very bad business manager. But it too, the people of Uganda never had a stake in the economy and in Uganda. That's why they were very willing then to cause trouble and everybody packs their suitcase and they go to Nairobi on the next bus or plane that we have gone to exile. Today, no Uganda wants to leave this country. Why? Not because they love the country so much. No, it's economics. They have invested in the private sector. So when you see people in Kampala saying, okay, let us go and riot, the very people who report them to police are those ones they have been with in the meeting, planning the riot, where they will pass and so on. Because they have a stake there. Somebody has a shop where you're going to pass and he throws stones. So he calls the police. Tomorrow we are going to riot. We shall pass here. That's what privatization did for Uganda. It secured Uganda. So these guys who had very incredible foresight. All of these reforms enabled Uganda to recover and sustain growth at an impressive average annual rate of 6.5% per year, maintained single-digit inflation, averaging 5% for much of the period Mutevira was in charge at the Treasury and Bank of Uganda, and also facilitated the poverty reduction from 56% in 1992 to 197 in 2014. However, with all of that huge legacy, we still have unfinished business. Mutebide left us with unfinished business. And this unfinished business is not all about maintaining his legacy, but also of propelling Uganda to the level that he wanted it to get at. In order to do this, 
we are going, going forward to concentrate much of our effort as well as resources to addressing the following. Number one, a large subsistence economy that has crippled household incomes and the purchasing power of the population. Ugandans have food. Ugandans look very beautiful. Ugandans look very healthy, but Ugandans are broke. We are broke because of the low level of economic transformation. We are working so hard just to survive. We are working so hard just to get the bare minimum. That's the unfinished business we are encountered with. How do we get people of Uganda out of this situation where they are working so hard for no money so that they can earn incomes? Two, high unemployment and unemployment of the younger people. We need to turn our growth into one which facilitates job creation. And we are working on this. I know my, uh, some of my teachers here have done some research. They do some wonderful uh, the, the first paper I read about jobless growth was written by Professor Edward Bale. I think 2014 or something there. And over time, we have engaged in these conversations. I see Dr. Muhumuza here. By the way, Makere University, some time back, a few years back, we were with Dr. Muhumuza somewhere having a, a cup of tea. We said that since many other economists have decided to shy away from these aspects. Let us be the only two economists in Uganda. So we started making noise about all these things. But very informed noise. Informed by research. And one of those researches is about the ability to create jobs amidst growth. Our growth now and particularly in the past has been very fast and sustainable but jobless. Number three, so that's the, two, the number two unfinished business. Number three is the high cost of doing a business. The cost of credit, the cost of electricity, and the transport. These have lowered competitiveness of Ugandan products in the regional and international markets. Number four is the low investment in scientific research and development to inform innovation and policy. That's why the professor Nawangwe was reminding me that money spent at Makere is very well spent. You are preaching to the convert, sir. I know that. Because without R&D, we shall not turn this country into what we want. Countries are developed by innovation by creative destruction, but not by repeating what you have been doing so much. You will not change anything. We are mindful of that, and we are working on it. Number five is the low level of industrialization, and this is critical. So many Ugandans have gotten stuck in agriculture. Agriculture does not transform a country. I want to repeat this. I've said it severally. Agriculture is good for producing food. But the food is what? Food. That's all. And the food has low income elasticity of demand for those who know some economics. Low income elasticity of demand means that as people earn more money, they don't spend more on a certain good. The proportion they spend on it is low. That's the food. 
I'm here, I've come back to Makerere where I was a student. Now I'm a secretary of the treasury. Do you think now I eat a sack of rice? <laughs> no. I am still eating the rice I was eating when I was in Nkuruma. The amount is that. But I've bought more suits. I've bought more shoes. I've bought a new phone. I've bought, I'm buying a time. Those are the things which take my income now. They are all industrialized products, manufactured products. So if we want to turn around Uganda, we need to have more people employed in manufacturing and in modern services. And that's what we are trying to do when we tell you that let us break discomfort. Ugandans are so comfortable in low incomes, in poverty. We say, no, let us remain the way we are. We need to distort some of those comfort zones. Number six, land ownership and security, land use and land fragmentation is another unfinished business. The way property rights are managed, it is something which I'm sure Mr. Mutevire would want to change. So that ownership over property is well defined and well protected. Land use changes. These idle lands we have all over the place in the city. People buy plots of land, they fence it with iron sheets for 20 years. In other countries, you pay tax to force you to develop the land or to sell it. That's how countries transform. But before that, we need also to ensure that all the people of Uganda have titles over their land which they own. That's how they will develop their land. Nobody will plant coffee if the land does not have security. They will plant simsimu and the beans, things they can quickly harvest. The high levels of corruption in the government, but also in the private sector, is an unfinished business. People stealing government money for own enrichment. People stealing money from the companies they work for in the private sector. Some Ugandans ask, why are these foreigners employing fellow foreigners? Because when they employ Ugandan, as a cashier, within a week, the guy, because he has seen some many millions collected, he gets half of the millions and runs away. So corruption is both in the private sector and in the public sector. And it's something we must work on. How do we respond to corruption? Not by just talking about it. Not by walking that there is a corruption day we are going to walk. No. Corruption is dealt with by improving systems, reducing human contact with money. Because if, imagine, if you are the one, every day you have a heap of money at the back of your office to distribute to people. What happens? So we are investing now in systems. Nobody now touches money. It goes through a system, because in the system it is traceable. If you deduct some, it will remain there in the audit trail. You, you, you picked some money. We get you. Procurement. We want procurement online. When I arrived in the Minister of Finance, I said, we must implement this. And we are implementing it. Starting next year, half of government votes are going to procure online as we go on phasing it. By around 2024, 20, 25, no government entity is going to procure by sitting in a room. We should procure in the same way we are on a WhatsApp group. You know in a WhatsApp group, when you are typing, everybody sees that you are typing. <laughs> when you delete, it says there, Ramadan has deleted. 
Even the members ask, what have you deleted, Roman? <laughs> so imagine if all goods in Uganda were purchased in a, such a forum. And that's where we are going now. We have also limited exports and export markets and finished business. And finally, the quality of health and education services. These are the nine major things that we consider to be an unfinished business that we, we are trying our level best as government to prioritize, but also to support the private sector to complement the government effort. Ladies and gentlemen, we may not remember everything I've talked about, but let's remember Mutevide for one thing. He taught us that through free exchange, difference becomes a blessing, not a curse. Huh? Through free exchange, difference becomes a blessing, not a curse. As a younger man, Mutevide grew up at a time when mercantilism an economic practice by which governments used their economies to augment state power at the expense of other countries and protectionism were the norm as opposed to exception. Mutevira knew that exchange is mutually beneficial. Nothing symbolizes this better than the double thank you at the marketplace. Have you ever realized that when we go to a market to buy something, you're going to buy meat, some beef. The person who slaughtered the, the animal, the fattest among us all, first of all, as Adam Smith told us, is not just a good Samaritan that he wants you to have good meat. No, he's serving himself. His own interest. He wants to get the best meat so that he can outcompete other people and he sells the best meat. But at the end, when you buy good meat and you pay your money there, in most cases, both of you say thank you to each other. As you hand the money to the man, says thank you customer. And you say thank you for the meat, for the good meat. What has caused that? This difference between the supplier of the meat and you the buyer is very well anchored in economics. The economics of specialization. I'm saying this to allude to a fact that as a country we must also avoid the temptation of using trade policy to think that we are going to develop the country. It's a bad shortcut. To develop a country we use industrial policy, not trade policy. Not to come and you say, Ramadan, increase the tariff on such and such a good. Because we want to stop it from coming. I would want to say that often economics works in such a way that mutual benefit, cooperation, and interdependence created around the market is the best way to go about life. In the market, we are genuinely thanking each other for having made each of us better off. And I would want us to take forth that spirit. As I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask a question. In all of this we have had, what role could higher education institutions play, like a Makerere? Apart from promoting greater productivity and work efficiency, Education is the primary opportunity equalizer.
we are all what we are because of education. There is no way I would have gotten anywhere near the treasury of Uganda if I didn't come to Makere. And being taught by these great men seated here and women. So since we know that education is the opportunity equalizer, probably the key to economic recovery now is in the ability of our universities to generate the kind of human resource that ultimately will translate into entrepreneurship and innovations. During the pandemic, Makerere played a role. They set up university scientific advisory committees and helped us to fight the pandemic. Universities need, now Mr. Vice Chancellor, Professor, and your team, please relax a bit on the requirements, both academic and financial, to take on more students and reduce the dropout rate, one of the effects of the pandemic. Please do everything not to leave any student behind, particularly those who belong to the most vulnerable socioeconomic background. You know you were setting me up, now I'm revenging. <laughs> Remember, Professor, that families are going through a very difficult time, so develop timely student centric responses to those needs. Universities should also play a role in economic and social planning. Enterprise incubators, startup support should be upscaled to boost local job creation and competitiveness of small businesses. As hosts of the country's younger generations, universities should think about practical ways of averting the growing boomerang generation. A boomerang generation, these are younger adults who return to their parents' home after university because they have failed to live on their own. What role are we playing as a university to change this? Because I've observed it's a very big challenge. People graduate from Freedom Square, throw the, the hats up there, but then, in the evening, they go back to their parents' home. As government, we commit to continue enhancing funding for universities to support the transformation of higher education in the face of these tectonic, longer-term shifts in demographics, technology, and competition. We shall invest more in online, hybrid, and competence-based learning, improved infrastructure. I, I went to my Lumumba and I committed. We are going to renovate Lumumba and box. <laughs> I had already been uh, written to by the minister, the honorable minister of education and also the first lady called me like a Five times, please help Makere. So I commit, we shall renovate the halls of residence and all of those areas. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, very sorry for being long. I don't usually have long lectures, but it has been a long time coming to Makere. The past two years, ladies and gentlemen, may have been a pain to each of us. The current increase in prices of essential goods at a time when we are emerging from a pandemic of unprecedented proportions may also be pos uh, posing real threats to our survival. But on the horizon, I want to assure you, the future looks bright. As you can see, I'm a tall man. I see the future is very bright. These shocks are temporary. The situation will soon normalize, and we are taking care of it.
in the best way possible. A way based on economics, not common sense. Let's not listen to alarmists and those who bend the truth to turn flawed common sense into economics. Support the ongoing reforms to create an economy that works for everyone. Those who are here be, seek ye the truth, build for the future of the great Mark Kennedy. A Makerere that molded all of us into who we are today. And I should say, may the soul of Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mutebire continue to rest in eternal peace. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramadan, for I remember when I was a student here and we attended uh, lectures like this, they always used the word doing justice to the paper. I, I think the audience agrees with me that you have done justice to the paper. Thank you very much. Um, the organizers have provided for a period of a short discussion, and they said I should also ask some questions, and the audience should ask questions, but we are short of time. The second problem is that it's very challenging to ask questions to, to your appointing authority, especially some of these topics can be uh, controversial in a way. And also the last issue is that uh, all the questions I had before, you have answered. But I picked some three uh, arising out of your presentation. The issue, the first issue is the point you mentioned about the lesson uh, Professor Mtebile teaches us on privatization, but you also built on that, on the aspect of Ugandanese creating ownership of this economy. Now, there is a lot of cash going around in this economy in terms of government expenditure, especially in the areas of infrastructure, in IT, in banking, in financial services. But we see so little of Ugandan is taking part uh, of these financial processes in the economy. Uh, we do contracting here, for example. If you're contracting for any job above five billion, recently we are doing contracting for the main building for which you gave us the funding, but also in the road sectors and the financial services, there are so few Ugandan companies which qualify to compete uh, with the international companies on these kind of businesses. Now, you said that we cannot promote growth through trade policy, we do so through industrial policy. I want to relate that also to Fred Rich Rich's infant industry argument. Don't you think that as government and as you the man in charge of economic policy should be doing something to one uh, protect Ugandan businesses and Ugandan companies to leverage the existing opportunities to grow. And number two is to actually uh, support these companies in several ways. Beyond the money, they need tax advisory, they need legal services in order to be able to do business with government. Because you'll agree with me, government is the leading economic player in this market currently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, of course, um, as government, we are aware of the low levels of local content 
in most of our projects. This has not necessarily been uh, due to the local past of our local companies. It could be one of the factors, but also because of the way we design these projects. Most of the project funding comes with the certain frameworks in which it is designed. I want to assure you that we are reviewing all these frameworks to see how do we ensure that project funding which comes in, because this is money which we borrow. Okay, some are grants. For grants, we don't have much because you, you can't uh, be a beggar and at the same time you define the terms. But also for grants, we have some levels now which we are using to negotiate. The current attorney general, myself, and other people, we are working so hard these days to ensure that the frameworks in which we are implementing, designing, appraising, and implementing projects, those frameworks are aligned to our national goals. Because within the NDP3, it's already indicated that local content is critical and how to support it. How we can uh, support our local companies. That's why UDC was restarted. To come back and uh, its major role now is actually to complement private sector, not to substitute private sector. Co-invest with the private sector using the money of government which money can be used for experimentation and then build the capacity of the private sector. But we have found that the frameworks in which we are operating, they could not allow this. I don't want to go into all of the details. So we are working on uh, the local content aspect. Also, you remember the president directed and the cabinet that we get a proportion of the government procurement and reserve it for our local companies. We have already started to achieve this. Most of these projects, big projects, dams, are being supplied by local companies now. Our roads and the other infrastructure, because of that provision. And I want to tell you, even World Banker projects, which are global, and they have certain rigidities. They have started it now to shift because we have negotiated up to the World Banker level. Even yesterday, we were talking to the World Banker president, outgoing president, that these are some of the aspects we needed to address. And we are moving very steadily. There is a, a project which is coming for electricity access. We are going to invest in World Bank man at a tune of nearly 500 million dollars to take electricity to many other parts of the country and in that project procurement about 15 percent is reserved for small companies what we call SMEs we don't want to see World Bank bringing electric poles from South Africa Ugandans can go and heat up the poles and supply as long as the quality assurance is catered for. So these things we are doing them, but there were frameworks in which we work, or we worked. What I want to assure Yusuf, going forward, we don't want to be uh, talking about the same things we have been talking year after year. These things are all written in our NDP3. We would want to see now very deliberate steps being taken. And that's what we are doing silently without uh, coming out and we shall wait for results to, to, to speak over, over the medium term. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe the second issue is, you mentioned a very interesting point, uh, education being the leading opportunity equalizer. I'm sure many people in this room would attest to that. Um, but public universities are confronted with a challenge where 
the money you give them as government is significantly below the unit cost of delivering a service. So for that matter, the option of cost sharing uh, becomes the only window. Even then, the fees charged becomes, uh, remain is low. Don't you think it's the time we should have a conversation about A, the financing model of universities, but also taking into context uh, the need to lessen the burden on, on, on the students, on the guardians, uh, by looking at the own of these universities, which is basically the government? Well, I, I, I thought you would be telling the audience what we have agreed. <laughs> because these matters, we have discussed them, and I told you, at least my position, and the, uh, and the ministry's position, you know, there has been a challenge that universities had almost divorced from uh, the government system. Like uh, the Minister of Education, those people plan a budget on the, for the ministry. Universities moved, you know, because you are self-accounting, so the planning is not uh, done in a way which is coordinated. And it was giving us very hard time at uh, the planning and budgeting at the national level. Because every university comes on its own. So I, 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 I suggested that we sit down with your mother, the Ministry of Education and Sports, and we look at a strategic plan of providing education in Uganda at all levels. But now with the main emphasis, because the other levels are catered for in the planning of government and the, uh, through the ministry. Because when I speak to uh, your supervisors, it seems that as, a univers as universities, public universities, you only go there when you need money. How will you ensure that uh, you are within the ambit of the ministry and they don't uh, say, ah, universities, all, you know, they are there, they're on their own. We need to have the universities fully uh, catered for in the strategic plans of uh, government because me, I feel they, they really uh, abandoned that kind of method of work. I can't believe that, for example, halls of residence and it can become a big deal to, to, to get to the levels where they are. These are things which a republic should sort out very quickly. But I think because of the silo way of planning, the silo way of budgeting, it was causing problems. So when we get together, and I'm sure very soon we shall, because we have uh, spoken to all of the stakeholders, and I also told the minister, she will call us, I'm sure. We sit and plan for the education, especially the quality and the cost of education in Uganda. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, maybe one quick one before we move to, to the audience. Do you see any areas where we have deviated from the lessons Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mtebide taught us, the several lessons you have enumerated, and what could those ones be? Those ones, I've spoken to them there. And uh, I, I really feel that we should guard jealously this foundation that Mtebide and his colleagues laid because it is a very firm foundation. I know we have committed mistakes, but we have gone away with them because of this firm foundation. But these mistakes should not be repeated. Of fiscal indiscipline, the way we budget, as I've told you, supplementary budgets 
rising now to over 4 trillion. That's a fiscal indiscipline. And we are dealing with that one. And I'm sure we shall win eventually. But it's going to be a marathon, not an event. Don't call me here next year and you say, the Ramadan, you promised that they will not be supplementary. But now they are supplementary. Look at the trend. It's going to go down. You like it or not. Uh, and this is caused by you, accounting officers. Huh? You, 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 you budget to recruit people in the middle of the year. Or you recruited people without wage. Then you write me a letter. I need a wage for this because I have a wage shortfall. Going forward, those things are not going to be accepted. I'm going to sack accounting officers who create predictable areas. That one I promise. Thank you. Uh, I will do the next question. I want to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we will move to the audience, but, but, but before we do, uh, I just want to announce that this event is, is live on several online platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I'm sure uh, Elon, Elon Musk, is that the name? He must be, he must be watching. Uh, we also have a live audience. We have some questions from our live audience. We'll be sharing them later. We have uh, uh, so many people inside here, very many important persons. We are sorry because of time we can't recognize everybody. But, but allow me to recognize the former Minister for Economic Monitoring, since we are talking about economic recovery, uh, Honorable Henry Van uh, And the principals of the colleges of Makerele University, if you could just please wave. Uh, and the members of Makerele University Council. Uh, we really thank you for taking time to join us, and of course the colleagues from management. Now, uh, we will try to, I always prefer one question, one answer, but let's see how that goes. And let's keep the question is to one minute. I will start with the lady over here. Uh, can somebody please help me with the mic? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, this is to address to the university and uh, our, our chief speaker inclusive because uh, he, he's, he's been a lecturer as far as I'm informed. So um, there is, first of all you said education as a primary opportunity equalizer you didn't bias <laughs> your statement a certain extent because of my query I have right now. There is a mismatch or a gap between the education offered and the required practical skill set by the employers or to, to induce or to intrigue uh, candidates to be creative and innovative or be competitive, not only national-wide but also um, regional or, or uh, in whichever extent I we would like to define it. For example, I will say this. The strategies or the policies or say models of teaching are not flexible to allow continuous improvement and uh, which, which, uh, which uh, in the long run or in the short run leads to um, to innovative and creativity. I have, I have one scenario. I, I did economic policy and planning, Masters of Economic Policy and Planning here at university, and then there was a course unit called uh, Econometrics. So we had practicals of stata and interviews as well as the, the theory part. So our lecturer then was really trying to improve our practical skill set by introducing the, the, the starter practical classes and as a measure of performance in form of coursework uh, or call it test. We were so, I was so disturbed personally because 
that cost unit were enjoying it, it is data analysis, it is, uh, it, you, know, you know, with all that the package contains. And along the way, our coursework marks, or our, our coursework measurements was cut off and discouraged, the, the gentleman was discouraged from offering practical stata classes as, as, as a coursework because they, they, they require us to sit down and write and write e exams and write tests and then they are, they, that, that's what they call performance indicator. So that discouraged us and it really points me back to the fact that the policy, the education policies or that are in place are so rigid that they do not allow flexibility and uh, that in the long run enhances innovation, creativity, competitiveness out there. Thank you so much. How are we positioned to attack this as the university and as, the, as uh, our former lecturer? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am sure Professor Nawang will have uh, to address that question at some point, but yeah, I think that is for Professor, but yes, Steve, would you like to, there is, there is this big question about the, the relationship between what the education institution is teach, and, but, but people have also argued that as government, you're not holding the private sector accountable to create opportunities for young people in schools to actually gain skills. It is extremely difficult to get many of these private sector organization is to give spaces for internship uh, or to train young Ugandans. We have a lot of engineering companies here, financial institutions, IT institutions. They are not investing in apprenticeship and training people. And there are companies which have done it, which have made it a requirement, not necessarily through control, but as a mechanism for skills development. Uh, yes, sir. Let's, let's finish this side and then we'll come to this side, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm called Musingu Zlaban, Joshua. I'll consider myself a patriotic youth. So we appreciate the various plans and safety nets from uh, relevant MDAs. That's to say the SEF uh, that prov uh, provides cheap money at 12% per annum. We have the SBRF, 10% uh, per annum for COVID recovery. But the products are not designed or tailored to the most vulnerable group which would be the youth. So as these in higher institutions are releasing more graduates, what are the tactical ways that government has or is putting in place to change this as earlier mentioned by the PSST? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had Professor Vyamugisha up there, please. Thank you very much. Joseph Atujamjisha, my name is, I'm the Director, University Health Services. I will start by saying that health is wealth, and also indicate that about 80% of the diseases can be prevented through health promotion and the disease prevention, mainly through vaccination, hygiene, proper sanitation, nutrition, and lifestyle modifications. And I must say that over the years, because of the improved uh, economy and so as done by Tumusime Mutebele and others who have also managed to improve some of the indicators starting with life expectancy and others like infant mortality rate um, just to mention those. The other thing we would mention is that 20% of the disease conditions require a lot of intervention either surgically or medically. Now this is where we come in as a institutions of higher learning that if for example somebody enters as a lecturer and is a surgeon that person is very happy to make sure that as they grow they are able to perform some of the most complicated operations that are done worldwide for example transplants complicated brain surgeries uh, and advanced research including research for example on stem cells and the biological warfare so this puts the university in a unique position, especially Makere University, because we have the human resource that can be able to improve and reduce the spillage, the funds that we use to uh, transfer and take people abroad. So to summarize this, it is very important that 
as we plan and try to improve economy, we look at having targeted and systematic prolonged support to university health services, to university hospitals, so that they are part of the mix in prov uh, providing services to what we currently have. And in that way, we can be able to, to reduce. We have also observed that the population has more confidence in the university in <laughs> services, to the extent that they are more likely to utilize this than all is thinking uh, to want to go abroad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to add, as you remember, we have been asking for university teaching hospital. Uh, I have a college friends for here, please. Professor Toombs. Thank you, U.S., and thank you, Mr. Angobi, for the presentation. Uh, for starters, I'm not a, a, an economist, I'm a physicist, so maybe I may go off, but it will be a question to be answered. One, you talked about uh, now urban rural migration of Ugandans, uh, increasing the, which has increased, is it, from the subsistence farming from 54 to 40 something, 41, and then you said agriculture can never develop a country. But I was also looking at this now, the numbers that have gone to the villages. What if a government comes in and uh, assists in making them maybe become productive in, f in food, in agriculture, which I'm saying is not, uh, which is not, uh, cannot develop a country. We have good big markets in southern Sudan because for now, because we are just getting out of COVID, can't it help in stimulating, um, I mean, getting jobs and by uh, producing f foods and so on and we sell to those markets? And then, of course, it, to me, it's now a contradiction because the government is trying to do a parish model scheme. So how does that uh, relate to what you said that agriculture cannot develop a country? Because I thought the parish model is to help us now get back to our food. Then the other small one is that you talked about the merger of the finance ministry and, and economic, economics and planning ministry in 1992. But I thought also URA, the creation of URA in 1991, I think September 1991 also played a role in the bringing down the inflation, but you didn't talk about it in your paper. What do you have to say about that? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think let's finish this round this side. Uh, I have a lady in the extreme, yes, in, in white. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm called Mutes Hadija, GRSC School of Languages, School of Languages uh, Literature and Communication at Choose. Uh, Mr. Ramadan, when you're talking, you talked about whole renovation. And it came to our notice with the, stata with the, status, with the statistics that girls are being admitted at Macquarie University at a higher rate, and we are like 51 percent. But we only have three halls of residence, and boys who are 49 percent are having six halls of residence. How are we going to work on that to create gender equality in Macquarie University? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we move to the Dean of Gender here, since gender has been mentioned. Uh, I would also request Professor Nawangwe to note that question on, on equality of the halls, please. Thank you very much, U.S. and our distinguished speaker. While I'm with the Dean of Gender, I begin my journey in political science. And one of the things we were warned about against in political science are the consequences of economic alienation. You have indicated very well that what we need is industrial policy, not trade policy. And my question is, what kind of industry are you talking about in our kind of economy, which is largely subsistence, which will not alienate the people or the masses and attract the consequences, which can actually take out all the things you have done? And why is this pertinent to us today? Most of our young people in the university are being taught innovation, incubation, and all these things are taking place. And many times you meet them out there with small startups, with small entrepreneurial things. Where do they fit in your economic framework of things? Thank you very much. 
thank you. Let me have a gentleman at, a lady, okay, at the back, at the extreme back. I uh have -huh, putting up two hands, yes. And, and then we will take one here and go back to, to Dr. Govi and then we will come. But I think Dr. Demma, we should take your question. It might uh, talk about agriculture, which has uh, <laughs> not had a very good day today. Please. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, I have only two questions that I want to uh, ask. No, one, please. please. Only one pick. The one you consider most important. Yeah. I heard Mr. Ramla uh, talking about the uh, economics of the country like Uganda. Uh, my question goes, why we Ugandans as a country, we lack an economic philosophy? A philosophy that will make uh, citizens to follow. Let's say, for example, Uganda country can say, government can say, let's make agriculture as a major aim in their country. So like, I think, I want to know why Uganda, we lack an economic philosophy that will make us run out of poverty. And then about curriculum. The curriculum has been set in Uganda. I think the curriculum is all about making learners what to think and not how to think. Why is the curriculum so it's just in their way. Making learners what to think, not how to think. So I want him to clarify me about that. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dema. It's about to reach you. One minute, please. The organizers want to evict me. Okay, thank you very much. It will be brief. Um, one of the greatest uh, capitals uh, for industrialization is going to be human resource capacity. And I'm really glad that uh, government is taking it serious and uh, there's quite a bit of investment. But there's a layer that sometimes is ignored and that is investment in uh, higher graduate level training, PhDs, MSCs. I know there have been a lot of uh, debates and arguments regarding returns to investment and uh, with the university starting to think about being research-led and moving to graduate training. I think it is good government thinks about this rather than us depending on donors, donor funded. I don't know what you'll comment about that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as we come to ask the Professor Nawang, there were two questions which were right in your direction. Uh, maybe you take those up and then we come back to... Please, my mic here. <coughs> Thank you very much. I thought you would let uh, Mr. Govi first answer and then uh, if I have anything to say, I would add on. But, uh, let me just respond to two issues and also ask a question, sir. <laughs> uh, the issue of uh, practicals instead of theory. The university actually encourages more practicals than the theory. And all our curricula are designed that way. So I really am surprised, but if you give me the name of that uh, lecturer, we will investigate. <laughs> but uh, you, you may have misunderstood him or her. Because really we encourage more practicals. Then there is this issue of the halls of residence. Yes. I think, uh, first of all, thank council and management that now we have more girls than boys. Begin by doing that. Because I will tell you that 30 years ago, the population of girls was only 10%. But if now you have more girls than boys, we have done a lot. Now the next thing is to see how we address that issue of equity in accommodation. But remember, the majority of the students no longer reside on campus. They choose where to go. But the universe and the government actually have a plan of building new hostels. Of course, we shall begin looking for money and we shall be ending up in Mr. Gobi's office. And when we build a new house, they will be only for girls, obviously. 
Okay. Now, <coughs> my, there are two questions or two comments. One is about the funding mechanism. I saw the students clapping very loudly when you said we should be fair to them. But remember, we are charging the lowest fees in East Africa. And we are struggling. We are struggling to manage. What the other, all the other governments in East Africa, what they have done is to provide loans for all students who want to go to the university. And they pay when they begin working. And I think that's the best thing. Let everybody get a loan. When they begin working, they pay. That way the government still keeps its money anyway. It doesn't just give it away. And I think government should, take, should look at that very seriously. We, some time back, about 15% of our students were from Kenya. But now because all Kenyan students can get loans, the number has reduced to less than 1%. Because they get loans and they can stay home. And the government doesn't give loans to those who want to come and study in Uganda. So let's give those loans. Then uh, the issue of uh, industrialization and what can universities contribute. As the, you are all aware, one of the things that we are trying to establish was the Tumusime Mutevile Center for Private Sector Development. And we hoped that through this center, we will do a lot of research, we will do a lot of training, so that the students that come out of the university actually go and create companies and create jobs. Already many students are doing this, but we, it is not on a sustainable way because we don't get any support to support those students who have good ideas. Many students come up with good ideas and they leave looking for jobs because they don't have support to develop those ideas further. One of the things we want to do as a university is to build a formidable business incubation unit so that all these good ideas that students and members of staff have can be developed further into business. How will you help us? Mr. Govi, it's your time, sir. Thank you very much. I will start in the, <clears throat> in the reverse with the VC. I think on the issue of the funding, the funding mechanism, um, let us sit in that forum of the universities and the Minister of Education and they discuss as well as assess the odds. Uh, I would think that to guide this conversation very well, as universities come with the very well informed concept papers. I'm sure you have been having this debate before. There are some work you've done. Put up a good concept paper, we sit as stakeholders, we discuss. Um, with very good sort analysis because some of these decisions have political economy dimensions. Our people are used to a certain method um, to take them away from that method. You need to put in a number of incentives and uh, we discuss them. I will be very glad to participate and uh, implement whatever we shall agree on, which is financially sustainable within our, our fiscal uh, kind of thresholds that we have. Because as you know, everything requires money from government, but there is a limit, I've said, uh, which uh, Professor Mtevile told us that as you prioritize, work within the cash that you have. So we shall fit in those numbers and we see. On the industrialization, apart from the research and the training here in the university, I strongly feel that you should partner 
with now the industrial parks. Because as government, we've adopted the industrial park model. And it is taking very strong now foundation, very strong root. Um, as Makerere, I was, I, uh, in, during lockdown, I did some work, some research work across the industrial parks. And some of their operators and owners and we were discussing about this skilling for industry. They were saying that uh, the institutions of higher learning could uh, easily be the one who is to partner with them so that uh, they can now train, you train your students from the environment which is uh, I think what she was talking about, the practical goes beyond just running the models on a computer, but they go and it's within the workshop setup, an industrial setup, those students can learn very well. But to arrest also the fears, I don't know who asked you that question, research now has, has found that actually contrary to the popular view that our human resource lacks skills, technical skills. The reverse is actually true. That uh, myself, uh, we, we, we carried out this study in all these industrial parks with my f German friends. And we found that no farm, manufacturing farm, or these other farms in logistics, farms in ICT, reported the challenge of attracting people with the, the appropriate technical skills. They said their challenge actually is too much demand. They, they don't have where to put these younger people. But they're already well trained. The only skills they reported which we are lacking, because we, later we asked them which areas do we have gaps, they were the soft areas these interpersonal skills, Ugandan students don't know how to communicate, uh, things of hygiene in the food industry, uh, things of uh, quarreling with their bosses and staff, but in, not the technical skills. Technical skills, I'm telling you, absolutely none of the farms reported a big challenge there. So. If we could partner and also we get to know now that side from, from them, it would help to, to train a full-fledged personnel who can uh, do these things. Um, on the issue of uh, the human resource capacity, I think this is the same only that uh, the professor was talking about the investment in uh, research in the uh, area of uh, PhDs, and so on, the percentage of the budget, I think you are alluding to the percentage of the budget we could dedicate to research and innovation. Uh, definitely, this is an area which is no-brainer. The challenge is, what do you do first? Because we are a bit constrained. But with the resources growing, and they are going to be growing now that uh, uh, the economy is beginning to even transform in, in numbers when you look at it, now, um, compare the numbers of some time back and now you see that Ugandan farms are transforming and the tax revenue is growing. Next year, we hope to collect about 25 trillion. So if revenue could grow, uh, areas like R&D, uh, they will definitely uh, be supported. And already government is supporting a few of these, only that it is a really a peanut uh, thrown in an ocean. Why don't we have an economic philosophy to get out of poverty? I'm sure that is a student of philosophy. Um, I would want to tell you that uh, as a country, we chose and I want Ugandans to know this, those who don't know. We chose a liberal, private sector-led development model. Very liberalized, 
open, private sector led. That's what we chose. But now recently the government had a slight twist on that philosophy by saying that the role of the state should be well defined in this philosophy. What is government doing? Because in the past, I think we were beginning to get complacent that government has no role whatsoever. Leave the private sector. We, we liberalized, we privatized. We are saying no, under development plan three, the state has a role. But for the state to play a role, it has to be an efficient state. A state which knows what to do. Otherwise it would do, take us back to where we were. So in that case you'll find out of the five objectives of the development plan three, one of them is for strengthening the state's participation in the economy by doing those things which the private sector cannot do. I hear a lot of people talking about certain things uh, like recently when the Uganda Development Corporation came back, it has been investing in some areas to support the private sector. We built a factory in Soroti of fruits, these uh, oranges and the uh, mangoes. People have been uh, saying that factory is badly managed. It should be sold to private sector, or government should find a way of getting good managers. The debate has now shifted. At one time, the people in that area were growing their fruits, and the fruits were rotting, or they were selling them to Kenyans, a sack at 20,000 shillings. Now there is a factory the debate has shifted on who can run it better. The private sector did not want to go and experiment that. Government has experimented, and that's the role of the state. Now it would be good, actually, if government could reduce its role in managing now, the, now that private sector is interested. Get people who can manage the factory on a business model basis. Because in the government, when he, he comes, I first ask him, where is the work plan? Then I give it to my people. They look at a work plan for a month or two. Sometimes they, they, they lose it in the file. Then he, I say, you send another one. Those things don't work in business. He wants to procure this one cannot buy. Even these things here, he has given you here. He can't buy it from the market there. He goes and he lines up with you. No, he has to first call the companies to come, sorry, to come and he bid. Yeah? I don't know how much he paid for this one. You might find, the, if we told you the price, yeah? it could buy you 10 of them if you bought yourself. So government is a terrible business manager, business operator. So the role of the state has to be defined. You drive industrialization by doing the following. Then the private sector should do the following. That's what we are trying to do uh, uh, as a philosophy. The dean of gender, what kind of industry? when we have subsistence. Of course, industry, ma'am, we are promoting it as a way of sustainably dealing with the subsistence. People are in subsistence, both in agriculture and in informal economy here, as a way of survival. They are failed to survive. Most of the Ugandans we call entrepreneurs, they are necessity entrepreneurs. They are enterprising not to die, but not as an opportunity. Now, those people are supposed to be working in an environment, like a factory. Countries are built by factory workers. 
not by necessity entrepreneurs. Uh, so, as a country, we must put in place opportunities for younger people to leave school and you are not told to go and create your own job. Not everybody is an entrepreneur. I've read somewhere in a book that in all of the human race, those who are born as entrepreneurs are 70%. 93 of us, percent, we are supposed to work for the entrepreneurs. In Uganda, we want everybody to be an entrepreneur. Why? Because we have failed to put in place an economy which can create good jobs, which can attract good quality uh, 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 labor force, and then the people will also now demand for the skills you are talking about. Like now we have built technical schools all over the country, but those technical schools uh, not, do not attract students. We thought that by supplying the technical school, the people will respond. You need to first assess how many of the people who are going to the technical schools will be demanded. And then you put up a technical school as well. But when you start with the supply side, when there is no demand, who will go there? Human beings are the most clever animals. They don't respond to incentives which are disincentive. So we need to do industry. That's the bottom line. Cottage, uh, do manufacturing farms, do ICT hubs, do knowledge-based industries, anything which is of good value, high value, adding value to people's lives. People work and get a return on their investment of sweat and energy. You know, in economics, they, they, my teachers used to tell me human beings will only respond when their marginal product is compensated. Uh, and in Uganda, it's not. We are having some conversations with the now professors. Professor Isali and his team, they are helping us at the ministry to, 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 to evaluate some of these things, Look, looking at them. You, you know, I'm one person who's very, very keen on having evidence informing policy. And I would work so closely with those who have evidence that this is the right thing to do. And we shall do that. Onugaros admitted that this professor has answered. Definitely, it goes without saying. When uh, the population, the reason there were three holes then is because there were very few girls. Now the tables have turned because of policy also. Government took a deliberate policy to take girl, the girl child to school, and it has paid off. Hmm? Now, by the way, we need also a boy child to be empowered. Hmm? Parents are in trouble with the boys because Many of them now, they're on their own, and it is becoming a problem. Even the families, we, we are going back to days where we have single mothers, because the boys are not empowered. They run away. Uh, so the, from those responsibilities, we need to look in all of that. But the halls of residence, I've told you, we shall work and they support first revamption of those which are there. We revamp them, renovate them to be to a standard where a student really sleeps in them with the dignity, not to what I've seen now at Lumumba there. But, and then, as the professor has told you, I've been, he has been coming almost every now and again with his team, entire team, and talking about these very issues, how to expand the, 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 the residence and also revamping it. We shall do that, but over the medium term because of resource constraint. Now, there is a professor who, uh, I think it was him, who talked about 
two issues and very critical the urban rural migration that reversal and uh, he was asking i think how are we prepared to support these ones to produce those now who are in the rural area and now he brought in the aspect of the pdm the parish development model that is indeed a contradiction when I say agriculture cannot develop a country and yet we are investing in PDM biased on agriculture. Prof, we are very mindful that to develop a country you need to complete certain revolutions. Number one, the extractive economy of Uganda must become more efficient, very well facilitated and efficient. When you look at agriculture in Uganda, what we call agriculture is actually not agriculture. Relying on gifts of nature, people don't have even seed. People don't have water. Those who have tried to do that don't have where to sell their goods, not even where to store them, and so on and so forth. So we said, and this was, uh, by the way, the wisdom of the leaders of the country. They said, why don't we go first and take resources to where people are? We have planned for them for a longer time. Let, it be, let them be the one in charge of their lives, their plans and so on. So the resources we have been using at government level to procure all of the technologies which the peasants have been using the subsistence farmers and so on. Now we are saying we are not the most informed. Take them the resources. Perhaps you are sending them what they don't need. This is intended to first complete the agricultural revolution. Invest in it, complete it. I've heard on televisions and the newspapers and radios that uh, we have cut the budget of agriculture. You can see now the way we analyze things. Actually, we have enhanced the budget of agriculture by one trillion and fifty billion shillings. On top of the one point about six trillion, which are you will find in what we call agro industrialization, mainly in projects and so on, we have provided additional funding next year of one tree. It has never happened at a go. Now, this money is going to be used by the smallest of the farmers because that's where farming in Uganda happens. These big guys are very few. Those people are going to get those resources and address one main factor of production which is constraining them, capital, to purchase what? Inputs. The role of government now is to ensure that the inputs they are going to purchase and spend their sweat on, they have good quality and good yield and so on. Now, within about four years, if we could do that, as also we invest in the projects which support value addition to demand what they are producing and also facilitate the marketing of those goods, we hope that very quickly we can complete the agricultural revolution. Once that is done, you will see people with a surplus which can be now moved to the modern economy. But now Ugandans don't have a surplus. They are growing beans to eat. They sell a few kilos to buy sauce or food. You know? You have matoke, you sell some to buy chicken or beef. You are still the same, eating. But we would want them to have some surplus, which they can say, now I have some money. Let me now invest in a, a cottage industry to turn my fruits into something else. That's how industrialization now starts to take a root. And the industrialization which is rooted at the ground. The school of languages, uh, the, someone who from there, no, this one I've answered. There is a, the, health, the health indicators and facilities. Doctor, I want to assure you that uh, this one you don't need to be labor. 
COVID has taught us that what we take for granted, sometimes they are very critical issues. And the, the vice chancellor has been very tough. He has gone everywhere because I, I, I know the kind of calls I get and they are all well corroborated on how they have been moving on a, a university training hospital. You call it what? Teaching hospital. And already there are certain developments which are happening. The future, that's why I told you, I'm on the horizon I see, the future is bright. And the light I see there is not from an oncoming train. It is a very good light. We shall, we shall do some of these things. The, the only thing is that not all of them can be done next year. We shall have to uh, sequence them. Um, lastly, my, my host here um, is saying that uh, students are doing internship in a very uh, difficult situation. The companies are not allowing them and so on. As I've told you, in Uganda, we didn't uh, want to control things to start telling companies do this and that. But of course the companies themselves have come up with initiatives and we are going to support them on how to, because they are the ones who need the, the human resource when it gets out. And they have been supporting us. We shall be very unfair to them. Most of the students do their internship in the private sector. And many of them end up getting employed there. And internship or apprenticeship is very, very critical. I know in German they use the, um, a different model and they helped every German now can do something. In German you can't find any, any single human being who can't fix something. Here we want to come and do our econometrics she was talking about by finding a bitter heart of Dr. Tom uh, find a bitter heart. You find. Then he, when you found it, he gives you a tick. But when you go to the computer, you are struggling to, to know where to click. And yet, when you, you learn the other side of the computer and the, you know how to manipulate it, within a few minutes, you have all the results. I used to really, now I wonder why Dr. Tom really, uh, you know, because these days I sit on a program and within a few times, you know, you have everything you want. But to find the bitter heart of Dr. Tom <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Adam Mugume and so on. So, the, uh, Prof, take very seriously the point of that lady. But this means in more investment, I know, in the computer labs, uh, subscribing to these programs, mm -hmm. encouraging so that students can uh, be able to access all of these facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I thank you very much. We've, uh, I think, spent enough time here. I request that I run away. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Before you run away, we have a very small gift to hand over by the chair council. It will not take us a long time. And uh, as I welcome Madam Chairperson of Council to the podium, please, I will use the occasion to also recognize uh, High Excellency, the Guild President, uh, the Guild Vice President, and the Guild Speaker. Thank you for joining the lecture. I will be brief, um, Mr. Ramadan. I'm aware you have several engagements that are waiting for you. The PS and Secretary to the Treasury, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development and keynote speaker for today, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, members of University Council present, the Vice Chancellor, 
and the management team here today, the family of the late Professor Emmanuel Tumsimam Tevide, the principal of the College of Business and Management Sciences, Associate Professor Eria Hisali, Your Excellency Nambasa, Shamim and members of the Guild, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. It gives me great pleasure to join the Vice-Chancellor and the previous speakers to welcome you to this auspicious occasion in commemoration of Makere's 100 years of existence as we celebrate a gallant alumnus and the world-renowned economist, the late Professor Emmanuel Tumsime Mtevide. Thank you, Professor Nawangwe and the management team and Makere at 100 organizing committee for such an excellent work in planning and coordinating this event. <laughs> Herbert Hoover, the 31st President of the United States of America said, the most essential factor to economic recovery today, and that was in 1932, is the restoration of confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, this quote is accurate today as it was 90 years ago. The nation and the whole world are still recovering from the effects of COVID-19. And as the speaker today has belabored the point, we need a restoration of confidence in our economy to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 and its aftermath. The restoration of confidence in our economy is key to the flow of foreign direct investment. It's key in our supply chains, as he has very clearly elaborated, in restoring confidence in the predictability of production of goods, and also in the ability of our education sector in producing solutions for societal challenges so that the public can depend on these institutions of higher of high learning. The keynote speaker painted a very vivid picture of our Uganda's economic program recovery, recovery program through the years. He also talked about the challenges presented by COVID and the impact on the economic and social status of the nation. He went ahead to discuss the way that government has set out to address these challenges. Um, Honorable Sam, I'm very glad to hear the efforts government is putting in place to address the silo nature um, that we have to date operated, the way we've operated. This, I believe, will go a long way in bridging the gaps between the education sector, specifically, and uh, government's need for the technical knowledge that is required to drive the economy. You've highlighted the role of higher education institutions in the recovery and resilience efforts, especially in the post-COVID-19. Makere University, the largest premier government-funded institution in Uganda, has enjoyed a privileged position over the decades of high existence. We have attracted a lot of funding from government and development partners trained a vast number of human resource and restored some of our labs and world-class status. Thank you very much um, for the promise that government has given and through you affirmed that you're looking to restoring even some of our halls of residence and increasing our infrastructure. As commendable as this is, we are cognizant that we ought to shift from responding to events that occur as we harness our wealth of knowledge to spur innovation. In other words, we need to move from dealing with the immediate problems but begin to look ahead like you have so well articulated and begin to plan um, for what lies ahead rather than just deal with the current situation. Now, the role of the pub private sector in undergirding this objective cannot be overstated. I want to just quickly re reiterate the need to further this discussion, and I'm so glad to hear that it's on your table as well, 
a discussion of partnership between government and the industrial park and uh, for purposes of, of, um, of apprenticeship, but also scaling up the research output for commercial purposes so that we not just research, but whatever we research, we hand to government so that you can scale it up for commercial purposes. This, I believe, will go a long way in influencing the funding model of universities. Professor Tumsime Mtevide might not have lived to see the full achievement of this dream because it was one of his dreams uh, which he set out, especially when he, was, uh, when he graciously accepted to become the patron of the Makere University Private Sector Forum. And so, although he did not live to see the full achievement of this, it's the onus is on us now to pick it up and run with this until we see its full implementation. At this juncture, I would wish to extend sincere thanks to the representatives of the family, especially uh, Mama Betty, uh, who spared the time to join us today. Your presence here at this inaugural lecture means a lot to us as an institution, alumni, and all those who have identified with and were keen to champion the values that he stood for. Lastly, I thank you, our keynote speaker, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, for delivering today's inaugural public lecture um, in honor of Tum, uh, our fallen comrade, Tumsime Mtevide. As an accomplished economist and policy analyst, he has merged, you have merged your economic knowledge and insight into industry demands to advance several proposals on the role we play. I wish to reassure our keynote speaker and indeed our audience today that the Makere University Council is committed to provide sound leadership that will enable us not only to implement our institutional plans, but also to make meaningful contributions to efforts aimed at ensuring Uganda's economic recovery and resilience in the post-COVID-19 world. I wish to thank you all for being a part of today's um, public lecture series and also to take the opportunity to invite you to our third of the Makere at 100 public lecture series on Friday, 6 May 2022, where we shall be honoring the contributions of another gallant Makarian, the late Oetitiwa Martin Luther Nsibirwa. It's now my great honor to present to our keynote speaker. Something that he will hang up in his office or home or wherever he chooses, just as a reminder that we value you in your individual capacity as an economist, as an alumni of Macquarie University, but also proud to see where you stand now all in the government of Uganda. Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. I'd also like to present one to Mrs. Emmanuel Mutevide. It's a beautiful portrait of um, the late Emmanuel Simem Tevide. I'll hand over the mic back to the organizing team. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Uh, but, 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 yes. Yes, we are coming to the end of the ceremony, but kindly allow us to 
ensure that the commemorative piece for the Tumusime Mutebile annual public lecture is signed. We are honored to have a volunteer, a live painter, that is uh, Roland Tibarusha, and he's a distinguished alumnus of Makere University from Margaret Royal School of Industry and Fine Arts, BIFA, and we are humbly requesting that this commemorative piece that has been done is signed by briefly the family of Emmanuel Tumusime Mtevile, the, gov the Deputy Governor Bank of Uganda, our keynote speaker, the Chairperson of Council, and the Vice Chancellor in the interest of time. The commemorative piece is over here. It's a commemorative piece. We will remain with that piece as we remember today's annual public lecture in honor of Tumusime Mtevile. The rest of us, our duty is to watch and also capture the moments with our lovely phones. They are doing it on our behalf. So, and it's courtesy of uh, Roland Tibalusha. He's an, a distinguished alumnus of Makere University from Margaret Royal School of Industrial and Fine Art. Yes, I'm also requesting ministers present and uh, any member of parliament also present to please join. And they are rough. Oh, okay. And I'm also very grateful that as this is happening, I thank the social media team, the physical audience here, and also the online audience. Thank you for all the tweets. I've been informed that um, our hashtag, hash at 100, is trending. Thank you so much. Yes, and then may I humbly request the next item is the, a photo moment over the, at the stage. A photo moment at the stage. So I'm humbly request, I'm requesting the family to move to the stage. The family of Emmanuel Tumusime Mutevile kindly move to the stage. Our keynote speaker, our keynote speaker, we are kindly requesting you to get back to the stage. Yes, please, for the photo moment, the family, Deputy Governor Bank of Uganda, keynote speaker, chairperson of council and members of council present, kindly join the photo. The vice chancellor, deputy vice chancellors, Members of Makere University Management, kindly join us at the podium stage. Honorable ministers present and members of parliament, kindly also join us at the stage. The guild president, guild speaker, vice guild, kindly come over to the stage. I think um, that's a happy family. And that photo will be representative of us. University management, members of council, Mark at 100, organizing committee members present. Thank you.
Members, as you get to your seats, we should prepare to have the anthems. As we get to our respective seats, we will then rise for the anthems. Let's just give, I think, two minutes for the members who have been participating in the group photo to take their seats, and then the rest of us let us rise. Hey, all right. <laughs> I've been advised in the interest of time. Thank you for gracing the Tumusime Mtevide annual lecture with your personal presence. And we have come to the end of the ceremony. See you next year. Yes. <laughs> for the, uh, for the Tumusime <laughs> annual memorial lecture. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh. One hundred years ago, men and women who were less advantaged than us today started this great institution. They have built it through the years to make it the great institution that it is. To produce the great men and women that have moved our country, our region, the whole continent and even beyond. They are the ones responsible for making us who we are. We should also make a commitment that if they did what they did, what can we do so that a hundred years later, People can also say, yes, a hundred years ago, some people made Magere even a greater institution, and it is what has made us what we are. So this is an opportunity for all of us to make that contribution. It is important for transforming our country, for making sure that our children, great-grandchildren, will live a life better than what we have lived. You will be investing in your future. Organize small meetings wherever you are, Makerarians, wherever you are around the world, and commemorate your days at Makere University. That is also important because all those activities help in building the spirit of Makere University. So please, I call upon all of you to join us to celebrate this as we contribute to making the university even greater. Please, you can follow us on our website, www.mag.ac.ug, and there are special pages there dedicated to 100 years celebrations.